right. Well, welcome Perkona Live. Welcome Denver. Um, uh, this talk is going to be about in general managing uh, stateful workloads in Kubernetes. So we are not going to be particular to, you know, any database engine. We are kind of going to approach it a little bit initially from the platform's perspective. And let's see, what do we have for agenda today? Well, we are going to go through the agenda, surprisingly. Then we will be doing a quick introduction of Tigris, uh, short about us, and then we will enter some time travel, hopefully. Uh, after that, we will follow with Kubernetes primitives and their gotchas as it pertains to uh, stateful workloads. And there is going to be a lot more through examples. Just stay tuned. So what is Tigris? Tigris is a cloud native document database. I'd like, I like to call it a data platform and we are Kubernetes first. Uh, we are aiming to be uh, an open source, true open source alternative to MongoDB and uh, other document databases. Uh, if you're interested, please check us out uh, on tigrisdata.com. Uh, you can apply for a beta account, uh, preview it and see how, how it fares, uh, the API I'm told is very, very nice, very, very uh, customer friendly. So I think that's uh, an appeal uh, to developers. And as far as uh, the SRE in me says, uh, I think it's also a nice platform to run on your own if you're interested. So it's completely open source, Kubernetes friendly. As long as you have Kubernetes, you should be able to run it yourself. And uh, one more uh, comment on the company. The company was founded last January and we are in production right now with a few users. So more to come. All right, here's the time travel that I was referring to. You have to man the DeLorean, don't you? Um, and if you do have a DeLorean, please go use it to check out our talk about Tigris yesterday. So hopefully you will enjoy it. And a little bit of all about us. Uh, so Peter and I have been uh, working at various companies in the past years and attended the same uh, university but we are currently at uh, Tigris we are I think the best described as the platforms team and pr prior to that we worked at uh, Percona and Zora together uh, Peter also worked for Dropbox and Sun Microsystems where it was still Sun Microsystems and I worked at Bolt and Groupon so a few thoughts about why Stateful is different um, well, operations are frequently distributed, so it's not usually something that uh, you can just map easily to a single pod. Uh, there are usually specific rules in the cluster that you need to cater to understand. So that's uh, somewhat more unique than a simplistic load balancer uh, can usually handle. Uh, the data is obviously the uh, core piece that needs to be retained, uh, copied across reboots if you reinitialize pods. Um, there are consistency requirements, performance require, requirements, and obviously data plays a huge role. Um, I won't detail that out. And also it, databases tend to have, or stateful workloads tend to have a much more complex initial, initialization uh, sequence that they have to go through. Uh, and that sequence may take longer than you know, just pinning up another uh, app server that is your workload. So we're going to cover a few Kubernetes primitives that um, are uh, used with uh, stateful workloads. Um, and the sections we are going to talk about briefly here are going to be the deployments. How do we do deployments of stateful workloads? How do we access those services we deployed? Um, allocations is a, an interesting area. Uh, affinity and anti-affinity. Um, and then we'll go into the more juicy subjects of maintenance, resiliency, monitoring, what are the gotchas there, what's, what's interesting. And by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Um, also, before I jump into deployments, just a little game we're going to play. Um, so Tigris is named after the river Tigris uh, and not, you know, the animal Tigris, which is often the tiger. That's uh, often called Tigris in some languages like our native language, Hungarian. Uh, so if you do see a tiger picture and you say tiger the quickest, uh, we'll uh, hand out some t-shirts for you. So hopefully that will keep us uh, uh, awake as well. 
Yeah, Tiger, Tigers both count. Yeah, fair enough. All right, let's get down with deployments. So deployments, the, the main uh, deployments uh, object is used with stateless uh, uh, typically um, or workloads that don't really um, need uh, the following properties. Uh, stateful sets are the default primitives in uh, Kubernetes to describe your workload. So if you happen to have no operators or uh, not a sophisticated system to manage your stateful workload, this is usually what you will touch as a uh, DBRE. And, you know, what that gives you is basically order prod creation. So you can always know that, you know, things will start up in a sequence. Uh, it will have a unique network and storage uh, ID associated with the pod. So pods are usually in um, uh, a Kubernetes environment kettle and not pets. And so they don't really have names. You just can use them. But stateful sets change that a little bit and they get uh, deterministic names. Um, and then along with that, because the names are deterministic, you can uh, you have uh, automatic constructs that will associate a, a persistent volume with those pods that will reconnect when the pod is recycled. And um, one more interesting thing is, and this is a little bit of a, a jump ahead into how you address those services, is that you can expose these backend pods through something called a headless service. Uh, Kubernetes primarily uses, or that's I think the most popular way of uh, deploying it, DNS to enable you to address these individual named pods in stateful sets. And that can be exposed through DNS using a headless service, where if you look up that service name, it will basically give you uh, the IP addresses of the pods. Um, it's important to, uh, to note that while the uh, network and storage IDs are static or assigned, the uh, IP addresses won't be. So they will cycle and DNS is the primary means to address said services. But, you know, sometimes these few characteristics are not sufficient enough. You need something more. You have a more complex, complicated deployment. So what if you need more? Well, that's when we enter the realm of operators and CRDs. CRD is short for custom resource definitions. When I want to create a new object, uh, say Tigris database cluster, uh, I can define it and equip it properties that, uh, that go beyond what a native object in Kubernetes with a primitive would offer. And we can equip it in a way that it speaks to the user and can abstract some of the complexities of the setup and the operator will do the heavy lifting for us. So it's similar in a way to, you know, relational database models versus um, uh, network access models where you're trying to abstract some of the complexities through some nice abstractions and they will do uh, the things for it, things for uh, the things for you for it. For example, it could deal with, uh, uh, it could recover the cluster state and understand how the cluster should form if the, the stateful workload uh, requires that. And it can perform exotic operations. It could understand how to resilver data. It could do um, copy um, data, you know, to specific parts for you, backups, restorations, and so on. Now, there are some caveats uh, with uh, operators and CRDs. They do have uh, a very good selection on, of CRDs for most stateful workloads. So chances are that if you have a stateful workload you'd like to deploy to Kubernetes, you will find an existing operator for it. But chances are that you might be one of the developers of, the, of a database engine, and then you might need to de develop it yourself. Uh, and if it comes to that, you will have to invest some time into um, implementing this um, operator. And there's going to be some learning curve associated with uh, learning that operator for your users on, hey, does it really do what I would do as a database engineer, or does it not? Uh, and then uh, there are sometimes repetitive operations. So one oper operator may implement a, a, a 
process that you would want to use in another operator. So for example, I want to take a cloning process. I might have to take that code block out of my operator and put it into a similar, but you know, differently named stateful workload and implement it that way. Um, yeah. Aha, who was that? Did it? All right, here's our first winner, yay. What what size? The three are back. Oh, we have a large. Let's see if it fits. <laughs> One size fits all. <laughs> and uh, here's an example that Peter is going to talk a, lot, a little bit about. So we are uh, we are building Tigris on top of Foundation DB. So at the core of Tigris, it's a document database built on top of Foundation DB, which is a key value store. And Foundation DB itself is more of a building block for uh, for builders. So the, a good anal analogy would be is that I bought a house and that house is Foundation DB. Then I would get some drywalls, tools, you know, shipped to me to to the empty land, and again I can build build my thing on uh, on top of that, and that's what we that's what we do. So the Foundation DB operator is able to do things like scaling the cluster, replace missing components. It can do upgrades, and it can tell you about the cluster health. How how is the cluster doing? What is it uh, doing right now? So that is a good example of, of what an operator can do for you. At the high, uh, we will talk about Foundation DB a lot. Uh, the operator has a nice KubeCutter plugin. I didn't see that uh, for many operators. So instead of you manipulating CRDs and do KubeCutter apply, uh, there is KubeCutter FDB, and you will have a, that is a KubeCutter plugin, and you will have a very nice uh, CLI interface. For example, if I want to take out two, uh, if I want to take out two storage processes from that cluster. I can do kubectl remove process groups and I remove those two. And what foundation DB operator will do is it will start two new storage pods, wait until the data is copied so and redistributed. And then when the pods are ready to kill, uh, they will kill it. And this, can, this kind of interface is very intuitive for us who worked with, uh, worked with command line tools before. And under the hood, it is you know, doing exactly the same thing. It will use the use the Kubernetes API, but it's a very nice touch, and it may it makes your life very easy. Also, there is kubectl fdb analyze, which will tell you it, it will run like a detailed hash check of your cluster, and it will tell you if anything missing, or if you need to do anything, or if it is able to recover it later, or if for that particular pro problem auto recovery is enabled or not, and it's a uh, it's a nice way to interact with more complex systems like this. Okay, so how does the Foundation DB CRD look like? Uh, there is the, uh, you know, we have the API version and the kind Foundation DB cluster, and we just have the configuration, like how many pods do we want for storage? How many pods do we want for logs? How many pods do we want for everything else? How many copies of the data do I want? Uh, we will go into these uh, a little bit later in detail. Huh? Well said? Yes. Yes? I will work right here. It's at that guy. It's up. Okay, and back to Robert, who is going to talk about service access. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, so we have now deployed our little um, service, and it runs in Kubernetes, and we have to, you know, get somehow access to it for our users. Fortunately, pods are not pets, they are cattle. They will be killed, and they will be ruthlessly killed. Uh, they changed IP addresses dynamically. That sometimes doesn't bode well. Uh, with stateful workloads when 
you need to form a cluster, you need to have quorum, you need to be able to address the specific pods. So um, there are some constructs here that you can use for your services. Uh, in most of the cases, uh, you will uh, use you know, a, a, a combination of these. Uh, load balancer and, um, and um, headless services are frequently used. Uh, the first two, the cluster IP and the headless, are kind of special cases to each other. A cluster IP is basically similar to a VIP in a way, and uh, the headless is a special form of a cluster IP that exists and uh, grants access to your service within the cluster. So if you don't need to provide um, services access to your cluster, uh, to your uh, stateful uh, workload cluster, then you're fine with these. However, if you do need, if you let's say have a, an API-based database and you do need to provide access, you'll, you'll either have to use a node port and uh, the traffic can access your service through the node network or uh, a load balancer, which usually means that you will be using a cloud provider's a load balancer to get access to the service. Um, there is also an ingress, which is more of a, I think it's transforming now in the later uh, Kubernetes uh, deployments into more of a full-blown API gateway type of an interface that was aimed towards HTTP and just basically routing specific requests, um, thinking in terms of uh, an HTTP-based, API-based workload. It was supposed to give you an aggregate way to determine where that specific request needs to be sent, and that meant, you know, possibly multiple backend services. So if you had to I don't know if you had multiple backend services and you had a search endpoint, if you had a uh, you know, transactional endpoint, document endpoint, you could direct those uh, requests to the specific backend that handles them. Um, and then there's also the question of discovery. How do applications deployed to the same Kubernetes cluster address your data service? Uh, there are two options, DNS and environment variables, what exists by default and DNS is heavily favor favored in most of the cases, but environment variables can be injected in the application containers namespace or in shell to uh, find out where a specific um, pod exists. But unlike DNS, which is dynamically updated, uh, the environment variables will not update until you restart your app. So DNS is heavily favored, um, but one major caveat and this is where the caveats game starts. Um, there are some uh, stateful workloads um, or semi-stateful workloads, such as Redis, for example, that only use and prefer IP addresses. So you might have to deal with the translation between a DNS name and an IP address to, say, populate a cluster file. I think I might be st stealing that uh, thunder here with my example, but uh, for example, we had to write uh, a little utility that interfaces with the Kubernetes API and then translates DNS names to IP addresses to populate a cluster file as these pods may go down and up, um, they come back up. Um, any questions so far? All right, if you do, please don't hesitate to stop us. But there is an example for a search engine uh, and how its the node file may look like, and that's entirely managed by you know, an operator like construct. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a parallel mini services or sidecar running along with the stateful workload, and it updates these files for each of the cluster nodes uh, automatically. It listens to uh, the API changes that go in Kubernetes. So if I have a deletion of a pod, it is it turns into an event. That event is, as is handled by this you know, little demon that uh, sits there, and as it receives the um, event, it will trigger an update on the node file, and then that's turning into you know specific actions on the uh, on the workload side. So it will understand that the inode has been updated, and you know with inotify, and it will rethink on who its cluster members are. Does it make sense? Awesome. All right, resource allocations. So CPM memory are kind of weird in Kubernetes. Uh, it's weird for me, who is uh, perhaps a little bit of a 
to seasoned Unix admin at, at heart uh, because the way they address it is they basically portion things out. So the main units here are CPU cores and millicores of sorts, and then memory is being addressed in bytes. And we'll be talking a little bit about disk soon, I promise, but these are primarily the resources that you portion out in Kubernetes. Um, and then why is it weird? Well, you will see soon a slide up that will hopefully explain why I'm calling these weird, but in reality, when you have a workload, it doesn't always consume 100% of a CPU core. It usually has time slices that it uses, and same goes on with memory. You know, you're not already automatically going to fill up fill up that buffer pool uh, in your stateful workloads as you start up the engine, except for when you have like hot buffer pools and warming and loading things like that. But often the the allocation is more than what uh, the utilization will be at first. So in Kubernetes, there are a few things that uh, uh, we have to be aware of. One of them is QoS and priorities of pods. So uh, the priorities are from highest down to the lowest, guaranteed burstable and best effort. And the difference between them is who gets killed first when there is pressure, all right? Well, best effort, unfortunately, is the loser of that battle. Uh, when you do not specify in your uh, deployment resources, so there are no limits or requests defined, that will be a best effort. That can also mean that the specific workload can claim as many resources that are available. Uh, so there are no limits, no guarantees. Um, but like I said, if there is pressure, that will be the first one being, you know, being killed. Um, first of all, means that we set our requests lower than our limits. This is pretty common because we want to uh, increase the utilization. So we want basically some pods to be, to uh, grab extra resources if they need it, not just have that poor CPU sit there idle. But uh, it also is a lower priority in the kill list than guaranteed. Guaranteed is the Cadillac, where you have claimed this territory, it's only mine, no one else's, I get the highest priority, my requests are exactly set to the same numbers as my limits. And here's an example from uh, a real workload. Um, you will find when you look at Kubernetes and, and, and all allocations that your allocations may be uh, around 60%. As that means we have requested that, that many cores versus available uh, capacity, of course. But when you look at the actual workload on how little it uses, it only uses about 4%, right? So that is why the Cadillac solution is not always um, financially appealing to everyone, but you can you can have different trade-offs. Same goes for memory, by the way, as this example states. You know the utilization here is about eight eight and a half percent, but really we have allocated about fifty percent according to Kubernetes. All right. So any questions so far? Does this make sense? All right. Which which uh, allocation would you go with? for your database. First one, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what I see used the most. It kind of follows our uh, mindset, but you know, we'll have to see if that, um, if for larger uh, dedicated clusters where you have essentially a larger pool of things to deal with, it might be okay to do uh, the, the burstable for financial reasons. Uh, so disks, uh, disks are by default ephemeral. So that means if you just configure a deployment in Kubernetes and you run on your, your workload on that, uh, that workload gets preempted, rebooted, killed for some reason, or restarted administratively, the data is going to be gone by default. Uh, so there are, there are obviously solutions to that problem. Solutions are called persistent volumes. Uh, many of my SRE peers hated that with fervor. Um, for the complexity that it imposes on them if they don't understand how to handle it or they don't have a nice operator to manage it for them. Uh, persistent volumes are frequently connected to stateful sets. As you will see a lot, a lot of times, uh, they are used either in stateful sets or in uh, custom resource definitions. And they can be provisioned in two distinct ways. One dynamically, where I 
uh, define my demands, I want a red ball that is about yay big. Um, in this case, it would be I want a uh, open host path type of a storage class about a gigabyte and just give me one and take care of that mapping for me. That's the dynamic. The static would be when you write a YAML or an operator defines a YAML for you and uh, it ties to spots because the usual constructs, the primitives, are not used in the case. So if you have a CRD, you'll basically see some sort of a static assignment with your disks. And one big caveat here as well, caveat game goes on. If you delete your pods, even on the stateful sets, that does not delete your volumes. So it's on the administrator to clean up those volumes, uh, which is a feature because if you need to, you know, recycle a pod and reattach that volume to the pod, it will be available. But some workloads will just reclone that data and you don't need it. So caveat emptor. All right, one other big thing, this is an eternal battle and debate for us on, you know, whether we should use local disk versus network disk. Uh, here at Tigris, we have had uh, performance benchmarks done and, you know, not so surprisingly, you notice that uh, with local disk, we can get a lot more bang for our box. There is obviously a, a magnitude uh, uh, difference between the cost and also the latency, so we get a lot more performance for the fraction of the cost. But at the same time, these could create hotspots and you could fill it up. Um, however, if you need performance, uh, it frequently, you know, you can manage it uh, smartly, then this can be a very, very lucrative solution. On the other end is the, what I will call the SEN analogy, where you have these PV disks uh, provided to you by something uh, like an EBS storage, and these can be very easily used. They can be um, having high IO limits beyond what you are, um, perhaps beyond what you have on some node types. And they are often expandable. So you can online resize them and be very happy. That helps with uh, operations. And then one caveat again, the caveat game goes on. All of volume expansion. I have seen not one, but a lot of cases where the storage driver did not have set that set. So poor admin went out over there. Database was about to crash. I just want to, uh, you know, resize my volume, increase it. That wasn't set. No good. You have to reprovision the storage, re resilver it, uh, restore it, and so forth. So make sure this is set uh, on your specific uh, uh, storage driver. And uh, hopefully the slides will be shared after the talk. If you use these links I included, they'll, they'll, take you to a, a website that enlists what storage drivers do support that feature. So sometimes, you know, the storage driver, it doesn't make sense for the storage driver to support this. So for the back back up. Okay. Well done. Did there with you? Venture fake. So it'll all be hot. I mean, it'll be used to it. So with the, mm -hmm. I was check food check. Well, we'll with the BBC, I mean, if I want to change the sites up there. Uh, I think you should be able to do it. Uh, we have at least used it with stateful sets and PVCs. So if you haven't seen that one, that, uh, uh, it depends, dynamic or static. Uh, the, yeah. Uh-huh. Is it? Is it? Until it worked. Um, we do is like, you know, the typical boss and the development. Uh, and the we can start a test that to make uh, all three. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. so, like, and then we will ship, ship anything off. Mm -hmm. I, so operator would normally use its own little thing. There is not an association like stateful set is a primitive that has this process hardwired, if you will, whereas the, you know, operators can just define individual inlets or islands of resources that it ties together with some logic. So it's up to the operator or how it wants to handle. Like the operator could throw away those volumes and resilver them as it gets reprovisioned, or it could uh, elect to run the API call and do an expansion on the volume. 
and do it online. Okay, so I'll call this a time in the neighborhood. Okay. So in Tigris data, we have foundation DB and our, our stance on that is that with these storage nodes, we will just resilver the data and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, recreate it if it's needed. Uh, it, the operator will, yeah, handle it and you'll talk about that in detail on how that happens. But it depends on the workload as well. So if you have a classic stateful set, uh, you could scale it down to smaller replicas, remove the old volumes, you know, change the deployment template to have the new disk set size, scale it up, and then the scaling would automatically allocate the newer volumes. And then you have to figure out how you, you know, get rid of uh, uh, patient zero, the first pod, which still has the old pod. But yeah, you, you might have to do some tinkering. This is not as uh, declarative as I'd like it to be by default in Kubernetes. I think that's one of the reasons why uh, more stateful workloads are not being deployed that way with the basic base primitives, but rather than that, they use some sort of operator. But it makes sense to avoid having to re-clone all your data all the time if you can avoid it. And then Peter's... Mm -hmm. And then the wash with the storage and maybe... Is it? Yeah. Love it, love it. They are working on a lot, lot of uh, uh, enhancements for Kubernetes. 127 has a few uh, service gates, um, sorry, feature gates. Uh, that is right now, there's one in alpha state where uh, it's called uh, pod vertical scaling, where they take care of the easier ones. You can scale the pods up dy dynamically without having to take the, the workload down. So this is going to be huge for us too. I absolutely, you know, think this is necessary and it could be that storage you know the storage drivers should support that operation i mean there's yeah it, it yeah for ebs specifically you can do that on the linux size yeah you, you, you can uh you can expand the volume online uh and then just have the operating system recognize it yeah so it's very feasible it's just not automatically coded for you Okay, cool. Any other questions? All right, we did that. We did that. <laughs> and now Peter comes again. Peter, your turn. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about how is storage managed in Foundation DB because it's very different from everything else. So the Foundation DB processes themselves are single threaded. So Foundation DB is a distributed database. And there are processes communicating with each other and one pod in Kubernetes will have one or more of those processes, but those processes are single threaded. Uh, according to our benchmark, because of this, local storage is up to 20 times faster than GP3 or than any network storage because, because of single threadedness, the latency hurts a lot to the, uh, to the storage. So, uh, when there is a failure, uh, a healing uh, mechanism will trigger in Foundation DB, which I will talk about, before replacing the pods. So generally speaking, you want to run your Foundation DB cluster on many pods uh, because of these mechanics, and I will talk about that a bit later. So about uh, affinity and anti-affinity, uh, you have... Uh, you have the you have many options for distribution. I will try to go a bit faster, but you can put your processes on different nodes, right? You can put your processes in the on different uh, uh, in different zones, and you can even put your prof processes on different Kubernetes clusters. So Foundation DB operator itself supports a layout when it runs an operator instance on each Kubernetes cluster. And on one of them, it runs like a meta operator, which coordinates the individual operators. So you can have a foundation DB cluster that spans across three Kubernetes clusters. And this is so Kubernetes admins won't bring down the database as long as they are working on one cluster at a time. Okay, uh, some example uh, about all these, mostly for later consumption when the, when the slides will be shared. What was? Yeah. Yeah. 
and say song cat, smooth cat. Oh yeah, what the Who's living okay? Is it one? Wow, okay, how do you do grain? So now you can choose between L and L. You can have any size as long as it's large. Yep. <laughs> okay. So what we are doing uh, to make sure that the that the storage affinity is right, we want to have a replica of every piece of data in every availability zone where the cluster runs. The problem is that the Foundation DB operator doesn't uh, have access to the nodes metadata, so does, it doesn't know what availability zone is that process in. And to make it worse, the process at the start, it needs to know its availability zone uh, in order to set it and in order for Foundation DB to make the replication constraints like that. So in order to overcome this, uh, we are using a mutating admission controller for the pods, which will make uh, the availability zone uh, available as an environment variable. And then we can start the foundation DB processes like, like that. And then we can be sure that we have one copy uh, at least in every availability zone of our data. B2, write the operator in a way that it goes down the object line. Yes. Figures out, figure out. And that would only work for that one stateful work. Yeah, the, and this is universal. Yeah, universal. So you can use it for Cassandra or whatever else needs the. Th that's why we we wanted to go down that path, and also you need you need to give less permissions to the operators this way. Like the Node API, they don't need to access it yeah, like this. Okay, so at the Foundation DB level, different topologies are available. You can either use zones or, or data centers. Uh, zones is the lightest. Uh, for example, you can spe specify different availability zones here, but then you will have no cross-zone traffic management. So if you specify a zone ID, like, okay, this process is in this zone, that process is in that zone, but you cannot tell a client that, hey, I, I am in that zone and I want to talk to processes to the same zone as I am, right? Whereas you specify the data center ID, and many Foundation DB deployments use data center ID to distinguish availability zones, then you can do that. But the, but the data center ID means uh, if you want to distinguish by that, it's um, a much more complex configuration. But with that, you can even run on different uh, Kubernetes clusters. So you can have a Foundation DB cluster spanning across multiple Kubernetes clusters. So today, I'm not yet okay. Met them in Kubernetes for like making sure that service goes through those paths that you'd like to have. And that's another feature I'd love to see in Kubernetes as well, that you can define locality of access patterns uh, and also figure out how to, you know, do these meshes. There are mesh uh, networks that may help. Okay, let's talk about uh, maintenance. Right, I'll, I'll be heavily maintained. I'll, I'll try and uh, pick up the pace a little bit. Uh, so we have to, obviously with stateful workloads, we have to worry a little bit about uh, graceful shutdowns. We don't want to go to recovery. Uh, and there are a few things to note. One one is that, you know, when you shut down a container, you might have to uh, allow it a little bit more grace time to end those connections, terminate them uh, gracefully. So that's what uh, post-start is about. Uh, sorry, that's what pre-stop is about. And then post-start, you might have to, you know, wait for some initialization processes to complete. Uh, we will talk a little bit about monitoring as well on how you avoid sending traffic to your uh, stateful workload before it's actually ready, before it has recloned its data set or some other process. But one thing to note here is that there is a 30 seconds default grace time given in uh, uh, Kubernetes right now for these pods to be terminating. After that, it will be sick killed. And uh, you can define a pre-stop hook that will start ticking when the pod sets, is set to terminating. So you shut down the pod, this other process will be sent along with the sick term to the pod. Uh, the, the process will do its own shutdown. Hopefully it finishes. If not, 
you can define a, a pre-stop hook that does uh, help you um, ensure it has, uh, you know, the right, it has enough time to shut down or it has uh, to do some maintenance to do the shutdowns as well. Uh, and then this is the uh, example I was referring to. Uh, there's a great talk by Kelsey Hightower on Monitorama 2016 about healthy. Uh, how the, the, the main points here that apply to us are that there are two types of endpoints these days for Kubernetes APIs that they would like you to also implement for your stateful workload. One of them is called LiveZ, the other one is ReadyZ. LiveZ is roughly, uh, you know, when the pod comes up, am I available as a process? Uh, ReadyZ means that I have finished my initialization, I have acquired the role in my cluster, am I ready to take on traffic? And these are also in 127, they're gonna be more granular, so you can have a uh, granularly constructed uh, monitoring endpoint there. And the benefit of using this endpoint with your service is that it abstracts the complexity. So whatever your use case might be, it might be different for MySQL than uh, Tigris, it might be different for Redis, you can implement that easily. And if you don't have access to the binaries, you could implement that as a sidecar, as an attachment. And a good example when you would use that is, for example, uh, Kubernetes upgrades. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how this whole thing uh, kind of works out. But Kubernetes upgrades are a two-stage type of upgrade. One is the control plane that is often managed by your cloud provider, and it usually doesn't impact you as much. The API might change, but it usually doesn't impact you much. Node groups are the, the one that problem we have to deal with. That's when we basically pull out the machine from under those pods, and we need to react to that, or ideally we would instruct our workload to handle that. Um, the built-in uh, uh, Kubernetes processes are often not great for your stateful workload. If you just go and press the upgrade uh, button on EKS in Amazon or all the equivalents, it will run a graceful uh, uh -huh. uh, upgrade process that will basically set the nodes to drain. It will evacuate your pods, which means, you know, parts of your stateful workload will get killed. Um, some parts will be, even though it says graceful, it just means that it's graceful to wait for any uh, policies that you may have defined pod disruption budgets. We'll talk briefly about that too. So what that means, it, it will, most in most of the cases, the upgrade will fail. And, you know, those pods that it killed before will be restarted. So it just is a, an interruption worst case scenario. It kills enough pods for you if you don't have a pod disruption budget that you may lose quorum. So that's a big problem. It would be really nice if there were some constructs between uh, a client. It wouldn't entirely be a kettle, but there were some would be some state flags for your CRD to say, hey, I, I need more time. Can, can we do this upgrade? that you don't just give me 60 seconds, I need, you know, a teenager, I need 120 seconds, right? And you could do that, that would be great. So that those constructs are also something that uh, should be in uh, Kubernetes eventually. And then because of that reason, a lot of people, most of the people that I know run, uh, who run Kubernetes uh, uh, in, in uh, so in stateful workloads in Kubernetes, do add another new node group, set the old one, to not schedule any new pods on it and start draining the workload with some sort of a pipeline. So that allows the workload to do its magic and eventually just remove the old uh, node groups. Uh, if you're interested about the circumstances of how you can do what the version criteria are, unfortunately Kubernetes does want you to go through uh, each uh, plus minus one minor version for kubectl and plus minus two minor versions for the node groups. So you could upgrade the control plane and run Kubernetes 125 with a node group of 123, but eventually then you will be forced to do this upgrade. So there are some considerations there. Uh, in the in, in, interesting note that uh, there is now a uh, long-term support Kubernetes uh, announced by Azure. This was announced in KubeCon in Amsterdam this year, which will hopefully allow us to not have to do uh, Kubernetes upgrades every half a year, because that's roughly what the cycle comes out to when you do all the math around the minor versions, but it will allow us to do maybe an annual update. Pod disruption budget, really quickly, 
This basically defines what you deem okay for your workload uh, in, in terms of unavailability. So how many pods can the cluster scheduler kill before you know we deem that it, it's hurtful for our uh, workload? This works for only voluntary disruptions. So when you scale the cluster delete nodes administratively, administratively it obviously um, doesn't uh, matter when you have a hardware failure or anything like that, uh, but it helps with uh, making sure that when uh, someone accidentally, an SRE accidentally runs a Kubernetes upgrade process, it doesn't kill your workload, right? Because it will say, no, I'm going to block you until I'm okay. And then it may make the upgrade process fail, but your stateful workload will be consistent. And so that mistake will be defended against. Um, I'm not going to go into the details about it, but if you have any questions, please uh, let me know. I'll be available after the uh, talk. Wow. He's really good. Wow. You, your choice. No? No? All right. You want one? Sure. Cool. Awesome. I think it's Peter's turn, I think. How does this look like for Foundation DB? We create the new a new node group, cord on the old nodes, replace the pods. The bold ones are the ones that is done by the operator. We replace the pods, wait for the data to be migrated. The operator deletes the old pods and it then can delete the old nodes with no pods on them. Okay, we are also, uh, we wrote a foundation DB exporter for, monitor, for monitoring purposes, which exports metrics from status JSON. And how, what it does differently is that the metrics are going to be tagged with the pod name, not some random uh, hex values. And we have tests for both the models and for the metrics themselves. We use that to availability, right? To tell yes. To yeah. So for MySQL, Mongo, and, and Postgres, the pods are exact copies of each other. In Foundation DB, they are not. And recovery uh, means copying fully from another pod or restoring from a backup. But there, are, there were lots of talks about these operators in the conference. So again, you can use the DeLorean. If you miss them, you can visit them. So how does that look like? In MySQL, Mongo, and Postgres world, the, the rectangles are no, nodes, the circles are pods, and you can see that the rectangles are exact copies of each other, right? So uh, you will, if one fails, uh, you spin up a new pod. It might be on a new node as well. That's why I put it in a new rectangle, and you have three copies again. Foundation DB is a distributed uh, key value store. And the number of replicas and the number of storage processes are totally decoupled. Uh, it has ACID transactions and serializable snapshot isolation. It doesn't support any other isolation, only serializable snapshots. And the storage pods are not exact copies. So for the high level, uh, I prepared some slides about the high level architecture, but I will skim through these. You can check these and um, and, uh, you know, uh, check this out or talk to me afterwards, and I can explain all the Foundation DB things. But here is how the storage is managed. So here the rectangle is a pod, and the circle is a key range. So within a pod, within a storage process, the data is not the, s the data won't be the same, but you, you will see that in the system there will be three red ones, there will be three blue ones, and so on and so forth. And Foundation DB will manage that you will always have the number of copies of the data you specified uh, with the uh, with the data distribution criteria. So it might be in another availability zone. If one fails, you don't even need to replace the replace the uh, the pod because if one fails out of this 15, there is enough space on the remaining 14. The light blue one is moved there. The uh, dark, the purple one is moved there, and I have now three light blue and uh, three purples again. 
I can add storage pods later and the cluster will rebalance the data. Okay, so the recovery of the data, the healing of the recovering the number of copies happens immediately, regardless if you are replacing the storage. And the, and the great thing about this is that the copy is a many-to-many -many operation, always. So it's not one-to-one, -one because the, to the purple and the blue uh, circles can be copied from two different sources to two different targets, so recovery is very fast. And I have one more graph about this. Uh, in this case, I uh, created a queue for, uh, for data to be copied. By having, uh, by having less storage processes than logs. So in this case, uh, FoundationDB is a distributed database, so it has logs and storage in different processes. So because logs were much faster, I was writing here with the light yellow workload, and as I write, the queue goes up because, uh, because the data uh, needs to be moved because the storage process is not able to keep up with the logs. Once the writes are shut off, the rebalancing triggers, there are less and less data to copy. When we reach the rebalanced state, the performance will increase. And uh, in general, the rebalancing itself doesn't kill your cluster, and it is happening all the time, but it is also uh, the measure of handling the failure. Uh, so because of that, this is a very resilient solution that you handle failure in a way that uh, with something that happens all the time anyway. And that's it. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, we will be outside.